Chapter 23, The Plagues of Egypt. This chapter is based on Exodus 5 to 10. Aaron, being instructed by angels, went forth to meet his brother, from whom he had been so long separated. And they met amid the desert solitudes near Horeb. Here they communed together, and Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord who had sent him, and all the signs which he had commanded him. Exodus chapter 4, verse 28. Together they journeyed to Egypt, and having reached the land of Goshen, they proceeded to assemble the elders of Israel. Aaron repeated to them all the dealings of God with Moses, and then the signs which God had given Moses were shown before the people. The people believed, and when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel, and that he had looked upon their affliction, then they bowed their heads and worshipped. Verse 31. Moses had been charged also with a message for the king. The two brothers entered the palace of the Pharaohs as ambassadors from the king of kings, and they spoke in his name. Thus saith Jehovah, God of Israel, let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. Who is Jehovah that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? demanded the monarch. I know not Jehovah, neither will I let Israel go. Their answer was, The God of the Hebrews hath met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days' journey into the desert, and sacrifice unto the Lord our God lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. Tidings of them and of the interest they were exciting among the people had already reached the king. His anger was kindled. Wherefore do ye, Moses and Aaron, let the people from their works? He said, Get you unto your burdens. Already the kingdom had suffered loss by the interference of these strangers. At thought of this, he added, Behold, the people of the land now are many, and ye make them rest from their burdens. In their bondage the Israelites had to some extent lost the knowledge of God's law, and they had departed from its precepts. The Sabbath had been generally disregarded, and the exactions of their taskmasters made its observance apparently impossible. But Moses had shown his people that obedience to God was the first condition of deliverance, and the efforts made to restore the observance of the Sabbath had come to the notice of their oppressors. The king, thoroughly roused, suspected the Israelites of a design to revolt from his service. Disaffection was the result of idleness. He would see that no time was left them for dangerous scheming, and he at once adopted measures to tighten their bonds and crush out their independent spirit. The same day, orders were issued that rendered their labor still more cruel and oppressive. The most common building material of that country was sun-dried brick. The walls of the finest edifices were made of this, and then faced with stone, and the manufacture of brick employed great numbers of the bondmen. Cut straw being intermixed with the clay to hold it together, large quantities of straw were required for the work. The king now directed that no more straw be furnished. The laborers must find it for themselves, while the same amount of brick should be exacted. This order produced great distress among the Israelites throughout the land. The Egyptian taskmasters had appointed Hebrew officers to oversee the work of the people, and these officers were responsible for the labor performed by those under their charge. When the requirement of the king was put in force, the people scattered themselves throughout the land to gather stubble instead of straw, but they found it impossible to accomplish the usual amount of labor. For this failure, the Hebrew officers were cruelly beaten. These officers supposed that their oppression came from their taskmasters and not from the king himself, and they went to him with their grievances. Their remonstrance was met by Pharaoh with a taunt, Ye are idle, ye are idle. Therefore ye say, Let us go and do sacrifice to the Lord. They were ordered back to their work, with the declaration that their burdens were in no case to be lightened. 
Returning, they met Moses and Aaron and cried out to them, The Lord look upon you and judge, because ye have made our savor to be abhorred in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of his servants, to put a sword in their hand to slay us. As Moses listened to these reproaches, he was greatly distressed. The sufferings of the people had been much increased. All over the land a cry of despair went up from old and young, and all united in charging upon him the disastrous change in their condition. In bitterness of soul he went before God with the cry, Lord, wherefore hast thou so evil entreated this people? Why is it that thou hast sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in thy name, he hath done evil to this people. Neither hast thou delivered thy people at all. The answer was, Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand shall he let them go, and with a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. Again he was pointed back to the covenant which God had made with the fathers, and was assured that it would be fulfilled. During all the years of servitude in Egypt, there had been among the Israelites some who adhered to the worship of Jehovah. These were sorely troubled as they saw their children daily witnessing the abominations of the heathen, and even bowing down to their false gods. In their distress they cried unto the Lord for deliverance from the Egyptian yoke, that they might be freed from the corrupting influence of idolatry. They did not conceal their faith but declared to the Egyptians that the object of their worship was the maker of heaven and earth, the only true and living God. They rehearsed the evidences of his existence and power, from creation down to the days of Jacob. The Egyptians thus had an opportunity to become acquainted with the religion of the Hebrews, but disdaining to be instructed by their slaves, they tried to seduce the worshippers of God by promises of reward, and, this failing, by threats and cruelty. The elders of Israel endeavored to sustain the sinking faith of their brethren by repeating the promises made to their fathers, and the prophetic words of Joseph before his death, foretelling their deliverance from Egypt. Some would listen and believe. Others, looking at the circumstances that surrounded them, refused to hope. The Egyptians, being informed of what was reported among their bondmen, derided their expectations and scornfully denied the power of their God. They pointed to their situation as a nation of slaves and tauntingly said, If your God is just and merciful and possesses power above that of the Egyptian gods, why does he not make you a free people? They called attention to their own condition. They worshipped deities termed by the Israelites false gods, yet they were a rich and powerful nation. They declared that their gods had blessed them with prosperity and had given them the Israelites as servants. And they gloried in their power to oppress and destroy the worshippers of Jehovah. Pharaoh himself boasted that the God of the Hebrews could not deliver them from his hand. Words like these destroyed the hopes of many of the Israelites. The case appeared to them very much as the Egyptians had represented. It was true that they were slaves, and must endure whatever their cruel taskmasters might choose to inflict. Their children had been hunted and slain, and their own lives were a burden. Yet they were worshipping the God of heaven. If Jehovah were indeed above all gods, surely he would not thus leave them in bondage to idolaters. But those who were true to God understood that it was because of Israel's departure from him, because of their disposition to marry with heathen nations, thus being led into idolatry, that the Lord had permitted them to become bondmen and they confidently assured their brethren that he would soon break the yoke of the oppressor. The Hebrews had expected to obtain their freedom without any special trial of their faith, or any real suffering or hardship, but they were not yet prepared for deliverance. They had little faith in God, and were unwilling patiently to endure their afflictions until he should see fit to work for them. Many were content to remain in bondage rather than meet the difficulties attending removal to a strange land, and the habits of some had become so much like those of the Egyptians that they preferred to dwell in Egypt. Therefore the Lord did not deliver them by the first manifestation of his power before Pharaoh. He overruled events more fully 
to develop the tyrannical spirit of the Egyptian king and also to reveal himself to his people. Beholding his justice, his power, and his love, they would choose to leave Egypt and give themselves to his service. The task of Moses would have been much less difficult had not many of the Israelites become so corrupted that they were unwilling to leave Egypt. The Lord directed Moses to go again to the people and repeat the promise of deliverance with a fresh assurance of divine favor. He went as he was commanded, but they would not listen. Says the scripture, They hearken not for anguish of spirit and for cruel bondage. Again the divine message came to Moses, Go in, speak unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, that he let the children of Israel go out of his land. In discouragement he replied, Behold, the children of Israel have not hearkened unto me. How then shall Pharaoh hear me? He was told to take Aaron with him and go before Pharaoh, and again demand that he send the children of Israel out of his land. He was informed that the monarch would not yield until God should visit judgments upon Egypt and bring out Israel by the signal manifestation of his power. Before the infliction of each plague, Moses was to describe its nature and effects, that the king might save himself from it if he chose. Every punishment rejected would be followed by one more severe, until his proud heart would be humbled, and he would acknowledge the Maker of heaven and earth as the true and living God. The Lord would give the Egyptians an opportunity to see how vain was the wisdom of their mighty men, how feeble the power of their gods, when opposed to the commands of Jehovah. He would punish the people of Egypt for their idolatry and silence their boasting of the blessings received from their senseless deities. God would glorify His own name, that other nations might hear of His power and tremble at His mighty acts, and that His people might be led to turn from their idolatry and render Him pure worship. Again Moses and Aaron entered the lordly halls of the king of Egypt. There, surrounded by lofty columns and glittering adornments, by the rich paintings and sculptured images of heathen gods, before the monarch of the most powerful kingdom then in existence, stood the two representatives of the enslaved race to repeat the command from God for Israel's release. The king demanded a miracle in evidence of their divine commission. Moses and Aaron had been directed how to act in case such a demand should be made, and Aaron now took the rod and cast it down before Pharaoh. It became a serpent. The monarch sent for his wise men and the sorcerers, who cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. Then the king, more determined than before, declared his magicians equal in power with Moses and Aaron. He denounced the servants of the Lord as impostors, and felt himself secure in resisting their demands. Yet while he despised their message, he was restrained by divine power from doing them harm. It was the hand of God, and no human influence or power, possessed by Moses and Aaron, that wrought the miracles which they showed before Pharaoh. Those signs and wonders were designed to convince Pharaoh that the great I Am had sent Moses, and that it was the duty of the king to let Israel go, that they might serve the living God. The magicians also showed signs and wonders, for they wrought not by their own skill alone, but by the power of their god, Satan, who assisted them in counterfeiting the work of Jehovah. The magicians did not really cause their rods to become serpents, but by magic, aided by the great deceiver, they were able to produce this appearance. It was beyond the power of Satan to change the rods to living serpents. The prince of evil, though possessing all the wisdom and might of an angel fallen, has not power to create or to give life. This is the prerogative of God alone. But all that was in Satan's power to do, he did. He produced a counterfeit. To human sight the rods were changed to serpents. Such they were believed to be by Pharaoh and his court. There was nothing in their appearance to distinguish them from the serpent produced by Moses. Though the Lord caused the real serpent to swallow up the spurious ones, yet even this was regarded by Pharaoh not as a work of God's power, 
but as the result of a kind of magic superior to that of his servants. Ferio desired to justify his stubbornness in resisting the divine command, and hence he was seeking some pretext for disregarding the miracles that God had wrought through Moses. Satan gave him just what he wanted. By the work that he wrought through the magicians, he made it appear to the Egyptians that Moses and Aaron were only magicians and sorcerers, and that the message they brought could not claim respect as coming from a superior being. Thus Satan's counterfeit accomplished its purpose of emboldening the Egyptians in their rebellion and causing Pharaoh to harden his heart against conviction. Satan hoped also to shake the faith of Moses and Aaron in the divine origin of their mission, that his instruments might prevail. He was unwilling that the children of Israel should be released from bondage to serve the living God. But the prince of evil had a still deeper object in manifesting his wonders through the magicians. He well knew that Moses, in breaking the yoke of bondage from off the children of Israel, prefigured Christ, who was to break the reign of sin over the human family. He knew that when Christ should appear, mighty miracles would be wrought as an evidence to the world that God had sent him. Satan trembled for his power. By counterfeiting the work of God through Moses, he hoped not only to prevent the deliverance of Israel, but to exert an influence through the future ages to destroy faith in the miracles of Christ. Satan is constantly seeking to counterfeit the work of Christ and to establish his own power and claims. He leads men to account for the miracles of Christ by making them appear to be the result of human skill and power. In many minds, he thus destroys faith in Christ as the Son of God and leads them to reject the gracious offers of mercy through the plan of redemption. Moses and Aaron were directed to visit the riverside next morning, where the king was accustomed to repair. The overflowing of the Nile, being the source of food and wealth for all Egypt, the river was worshipped as a god, and the monarch came thither daily to pay his devotions. Here the two brothers again repeated the message to him, and then they stretched out the rod and smote upon the river. The sacred stream ran blood, the fish died, and the river became offensive to the smell. The water in the houses, the supply preserved in cisterns, was likewise changed to blood. But the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments, and Pharaoh turned and went into his house neither did he set his heart to this also. For seven days the plague continued, but without effect. Again the rod was stretched out over the waters, and frogs came up from the river and spread over the land. They overran the houses, took possession of the bedchambers, and even the ovens and kneading troughs. The frog was regarded as sacred by the Egyptians, and they would not destroy it, but the slimy pests had now become intolerable. They swarmed even in the palace of the pharaohs, and the king was impatient to have them removed. The magicians had appeared to produce frogs, but they could not remove them. Upon seeing this, Pharaoh was somewhat humbled. He sent for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go that they may do sacrifice unto the Lord. After reminding the king of his former boasting, they requested him to appoint a time when they should pray for the removal of the plague. He set the next day, secretly hoping that in the interval the frogs might disappear themselves, and thus save him from the bitter humiliation of submitting to the God of Israel. The plague, however, continued till the time specified, when throughout all Egypt the frogs died but their putrid bodies which remained polluted the atmosphere. The Lord could have caused them to return to dust in a moment, but he did not do this lest after their removal the king and his people should pronounce it the result of sorcery or enchantment like the work of the magicians. The frogs died and were then gathered together in heaps. Here the king and all Egypt had evidence which their vain philosophy could not gainsay, that this work was not accomplished by magic, but was a judgment from the God of heaven. When Pharaoh saw that there was respite, he hardened his heart. At the command of God, Aaron stretched out his hand, and the dust of the earth became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. 
Pharaoh called upon the magicians to do the same, but they could not. The work of God was thus shown to be superior to that of Satan. The magicians themselves acknowledged, This is the finger of God. But the king was still unmoved. Appeal and warning were ineffectual, and another judgment was inflicted. The time of its occurrence was foretold that it might not be said to have come by chance. Flies filled the houses and swarmed upon the ground so that the land was corrupted by reason of the swarms of flies. These flies were large and venomous, and their bite was extremely painful to man and beast. As had been foretold, this visitation did not extend to the land of Goshen. Pharaoh now offered the Israelites permission to sacrifice in Egypt, but they refused to accept such conditions. It is not meet, said Moses, Lo, shall we sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes, and will they not stone us? The animals which the Hebrews would be required to sacrifice were among those regarded as sacred by the Egyptians, and such was the reverence in which these creatures were held, that to slay one, even accidentally, was a crime punishable with death. It would be impossible for the Hebrews to worship in Egypt without giving offense to their masters. Moses again proposed to go three days' journey into the wilderness. The monarch consented, and begged the servants of God to entreat that the plague might be removed. They promised to do this, but warned him against dealing deceitfully with them. The plague was stayed, but the king's heart had become hardened by persistent rebellion, and he still refused to yield. A more terrible stroke followed. Murain upon all the Egyptian cattle that were in the field, both the sacred animals and the beasts of burden, kine and oxen and sheep, horses and camels and asses, were destroyed. It had been distinctly stated that the Hebrews were to be exempt, and Pharaoh, on sending messengers to the home of the Israelites, proved the truth of this declaration of Moses. Of the cattle of the children of Israel died not one. Still, the king was obstinate. Moses was next directed to take ashes of the furnace and sprinkle it toward heaven in the sight of Pharaoh. This act was deeply significant. Four hundred years before, God had shown to Abraham the future oppression of his people under the figure of a smoking furnace and a burning lamp. He had declared that he would visit judgments upon their oppressors and would bring forth the captives with great substance. In Egypt, Israel had long languished in the furnace of affliction. This act of Moses was an assurance to them that God was mindful of his covenant and that the time for their deliverance had come. As the ashes were sprinkled toward heaven, the fine particles spread over all the land of Egypt, and wherever they settled produced boils, breaking forth with blains upon man and upon beast. The priests and magicians had hitherto encouraged Pharaoh in his stubbornness, but now a judgment had come that reached even them. Smitten with a loathsome and painful disease, their vaunted power only making them contemptible, they were no longer able to contend against the God of Israel. The whole nation was made to see the folly of trusting in the magicians, when they were not able to protect even their own persons. Still the heart of Pharaoh grew harder. And now the Lord sent a message to him, declaring, I will at this time send all my plagues upon thy heart and upon thy servants, and upon thy people, that thou mayest know that there is none like me in all the earth, and in very deed for this cause have I raised thee up, for to show in thee my power. Not that God had given him an existence for this purpose, but his providence had overruled events to place him upon the throne at the very time appointed for Israel's deliverance. Though this haughty tyrant had by his crimes forfeited the mercy of God, yet his life had been preserved that through his stubbornness the Lord might manifest his wonders in the land of Egypt. The disposing of events is of God's providence. He could have placed upon the throne a more merciful king, who would not have dared to withstand the mighty manifestations of divine power. But in that case, the Lord's purposes would not have been accomplished. His people were permitted to experience the grinding cruelty of the Egyptians, that they might not be deceived concerning the debasing influence of idolatry. 
In his dealing with Pharaoh, the Lord manifested his hatred of idolatry and his determination to punish cruelty and oppression. God had declared concerning Pharaoh, I will harden his heart that he shall not let the people go. Exodus chapter 4 verse 21. There was no exercise of supernatural power to harden the heart of the king. God gave to Pharaoh the most striking evidence of divine power, but the monarch stubbornly refused to heed the light. Every display of infinite power rejected by him rendered him the more determined in his rebellion. The seeds of rebellion that he sowed when he rejected the first miracle produced their harvest. As he continued to venture on in his own course, going from one degree of stubbornness to another, his heart became more and more hardened until he was called to look upon the cold, dead faces of the firstborn. God speaks to men through his servants, giving cautions and warnings and rebuking sin. He gives to each an opportunity to correct his errors before they become fixed in the character. But if one refuses to be corrected, divine power does not interpose to counteract the tendency of his own action. He finds it more easy to repeat the same course. He is hardening the heart against the influence of the Holy Spirit. A further rejection of light places him where a far stronger influence will be ineffectual to make an abiding impression. He who has once yielded to temptation will yield more readily the second time. Every repetition of the sin lessens his power of resistance, blinds his eyes, and stifles conviction. Every seed of indulgence sown will bear fruit. God works no miracle to prevent the harvest. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. He who manifests an infidel hardihood, a stolid indifference to divine truth, is but reaping the harvest of that which he has himself sown. It is thus that multitudes come to listen with stoical indifference to the truths that once stirred their very souls. They sowed neglect and resistance to the truth, and such is the harvest which they reap. Those who are quieting a guilty conscience with the thought that they can change a course of evil when they choose, that they can trifle with the invitations of mercy, and yet be again and again impressed, take this course at their peril. They think that after casting all their influence on the side of the great rebel, in a moment of utmost extremity, when danger compasses them about, they will change leaders. But this is not so easily done. The experience, the education, the discipline of a life of sinful indulgence has so thoroughly molded the character that they cannot then receive the image of God. Had no light shone upon their pathway, the case would have been different. Mercy might interpose and give them an opportunity to accept her overtures. But after light has been long rejected and despised, it will be finally withdrawn. A plague of hail was next threatened upon Pharaoh with the warning, Send therefore now, and gather thy cattle, and all that thou hast in the field. For upon every man and beast which shall be found in the field, and shall not be brought home, the hail shall come down upon them, and they shall die. Rain or hail was unusual in Egypt, and such a storm as was foretold had never been witnessed. The report spread rapidly, and all who believed the word of the Lord gathered in their cattle, while those who despised the warning left them in the field. Thus in the midst of judgment the mercy of God was displayed, the people were tested, and it was shown how many had been led to fear God by the manifestation of His power. The storm came as predicted, thunder and hail and fire mingled with it, very grievous, such as there was none like it in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. And the hail smote throughout all the land of Egypt, all that was in the field, both man and beast. And the hail smote every herb of the field, and brake every tree of the field. Ruin and desolation marked the path of the destroying angel. The land of Goshen alone was spared. It was demonstrated to the Egyptians that the earth is under the control of the living God, that the elements obey His voice, and that the only safety is in obedience to Him. All Egypt trembled before the awful outpouring of divine judgment. 
Ferial hastily sent for the two brothers and cried out, I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous, and I and my people are wicked. Entreat the Lord, for it is enough that there be no more mighty thunderings and hail, and I will let you go, and ye shall stay no longer. The answer was, As soon as I am gone out of the city, I will spread abroad my hands unto the Lord, and the thunder shall cease. Neither shall there be any more hail, that thou mayest know how that the earth is the Lord's. But as for thee and thy servants, I know that ye will not yet fear the Lord God. Moses knew that the contest was not ended. Pharaoh's confessions and promises were not the effect of any radical change in his mind or heart, but were wrung from him by terror and anguish. Moses promised, however, to grant his request, for he would give him no occasion for further stubbornness. The prophet went forth, unheeding the fury of the tempest, and Pharaoh and all his host were witnesses to the power of Jehovah to preserve his messenger. Having passed without the city, Moses spread abroad his hands unto the Lord, and the thunders and hail ceased, and the rain was not poured upon the earth. But no sooner had the king recovered from his fears than his heart returned to its perversity. Then the Lord said unto Moses, Go in unto Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I might show these my signs before him, and that thou mayest tell in the ears of thy son and of thy son's son what things I have wrought in Egypt, and my signs which I have done among them, that ye may know how that I am Jehovah. The Lord was manifesting his power to confirm the faith of Israel in him as the only true and living God. He would give unmistakable evidence of the difference he placed between them and the Egyptians, and would cause all nations to know that the Hebrews, whom they had despised and oppressed, were under the protection of the God of heaven. Moses warned the monarch that if he still remained obstinate, a plague of locusts would be sent, which would cover the face of the earth and eat up every green thing that remained. They would fill the houses, even the palace itself, such a scourge, he said, as neither thy fathers nor thy father's fathers have seen since the day that they were upon the earth unto this day. The counselors of Pharaoh stood aghast. The nation had sustained great loss in the death of their cattle. Many of the people had been killed by the hail. The forests were broken down and the crops destroyed. They were fast losing all that had been gained by the labor of the Hebrews. The whole land was threatened with starvation. Princes and courtiers pressed about the king and angrily demanded, How long shall this man be a snare unto us? Let the men go, that they may serve the Lord their God. Knowest thou not yet that Egypt is destroyed? Moses and Aaron were again summoned, and the monarch said to them, Go, serve the Lord your God. But who are they that shall go? The answer was, we will go with our young and with our old, with our sons and with our daughters, with our flocks and with our herds will we go, for we must hold a feast unto the Lord. The king was filled with rage. Let the Lord be so with you, he cried, as I will let you go and your little ones. Look to it, for evil is before you. Not so. Go now, ye that are men, and serve the Lord, for that ye did desire and they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. Pharaoh had endeavored to destroy the Israelites by hard labor, but he now pretended to have a deep interest in their welfare and a tender care for their little ones. His real object was to keep the women and children as surety for the return of the men. Moses now stretched forth his rod over the land, and an east wind blew and brought locusts. Very grievous were they. Before them there were no such locusts as they, neither after them shall be such. They filled the sky till the land was darkened, and devoured every green thing remaining. Pharaoh sent for the prophets in haste, and said, I have sinned against the Lord your God, and against you. Now therefore forgive, I pray thee, my sin only this once, and entreat the Lord your God that he may take away from me this death only. They did so and a strong west wind carried away the locusts toward the Red Sea. Still, the king persisted in his stubborn resolution. The people of Egypt were ready to despair. 
The scourges that had already fallen upon them seemed almost beyond endurance, and they were filled with fear for the future. The nation had worshipped Pharaoh as a representative of their God, but many were now convinced that he was opposing himself to one who made all the powers of nature the ministers of his will. The Hebrew slaves, so miraculously favored, were becoming confident of deliverance. Their taskmasters dared not oppress them as heretofore. Throughout Egypt there was a secret fear that the enslaved race would rise and avenge their wrongs. Everywhere men were asking with bated breath, what will come next? Suddenly a darkness settled upon the land, so thick and black that it seemed a darkness which may be felt. Not only were the people deprived of light, but the atmosphere was very oppressive, so that breathing was difficult. They saw not one another, neither rose any from his place for three days, but all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. The sun and moon were objects of worship to the Egyptians. In this mysterious darkness the people and their gods alike were smitten by the power that had undertaken the cause of the bondmen. Yet fearful as it was, this judgment is an evidence of God's compassion and His unwillingness to destroy. He would give the people time for reflection and repentance before bringing upon them the last and most terrible of the plagues. Fear at last wrung from Pharaoh a further concession. At the end of the third day of darkness he summoned Moses and consented to the departure of the people, provided the flocks and herds were permitted to remain. There shall not an hoof be left behind, replied the resolute Hebrew. We know not with what we must serve the Lord until we come thither. The king's anger burst forth beyond control. Get thee from me, he cried. Take heed to thyself. See my face no more. For in that day that thou seest my face, thou shalt die. The answer was, Thou hast spoken well. I will see thy face again no more. The man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants, and in the sight of the people. Moses was regarded with awe by the Egyptians. The king dared not harm him, for the people looked upon him as alone possessing power to remove the plagues. They desired that the Israelites might be permitted to leave Egypt. It was the king and the priests that opposed to the last the demands of Moses. Moses.